Alright, hey guys, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about something very important for your business as a game development company or just an individual developing new video games. So this one's probably going to be a little bit longer and more complicated, but I promise you it's going to be worth it, so stick around until the end. Before we get going, remember if you're new here, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button if you like this video. And remember that there is a Discord link in the description, and that's for mine. You can come out and hang out with a bunch of developers, you can come and hang out with a bunch of players, and me specifically. But now let's start talking about this whole strategizing business. So first, what's so important about a strategy? Well, if you don't have a strategy and you're just kind of going blindly, you're, you're not going to get very far. You need some plan of attack, some plan to market, or even some plan to move forward with your game. So to address the first couple simple questions, first, what is a strategy? Well, the Harvard Business School describes it as an integrated set of choices that positions a company in an industry so as to generate superior financial returns over the long run. The key words in this are integrated choices and long run. Strategy is not a set of goals or aspirations. Strategy is not a set of actions, but rather the choices that you make along the way to distinguish yourself from others in the same market share or niche as you. Integrated in this sense means that the choices support each other and create better focus for your direction. In other words, the choices you make work together and they're not entirely independent of each other. They have to do with each other. And so now to answer the next question, why do we need a strategy? Well, let's put it this way. You want to make sure you have the right choices for you, your team, company, and so that your company can reach its goals. There's a lot of uncertainty in our world and specifically in business. Things change incredibly quickly. So you need to make sure that you can mitigate this as much as possible, or in other words, reduce the risk that you will be impacted negatively. So how do we begin thinking about a strategy for our business? Well, first it's important to understand that you need to know what your market looks like. What do your competitors have? What different factors are currently affecting you and your path to success. There are a lot of different ways to think about how this industry is structured or how your niche operates, but I'd like to suggest using a framework called Porter's Five Forces. It's very simple, it's really powerful, and it really helps you map out what's going on in your market share and helps you think about the market, not just you and your competitors, but also your customers and your suppliers and various other factors that you might not think about right away. How you want to do this is in each of the categories I'm about to go over, you want to label the different elements as high or low influence. High influence means you have to be careful and think about how you could counter that force. And low influence means that you don't really have to worry about it too much, but you could probably use it to your advantage should you so choose. We'll get deeper into it in a little bit, but first I just want to let you know the analysis we will present is focused pretty much on indie game developers and based a lot on my experience and the people I've talked to as experience. But this is very applicable to almost any industry and even things you do in your own life and how you map through and create a strategy to excel in your area. As you can see on this chart, Porter's Five Forces is divided into five boxes. Let's go through them real quick. We have the bargaining power of suppliers, threat of new entrants, rivalry among existing competitors, threat of substitutes, and bargaining power of consumers. In the case of indie game developers, there are several parties we can consider suppliers. For example, video game engine developers, such as the developers of Unreal, Unity, and Godot, computer manufacturers, service providers, Service providers might be a little bit more abstract, but if you think about it, YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, asset stores, artists, software developers, these are all suppliers that could influence the process by which you make your game. To understand this impact, we need to think about the switching costs. How easy is it for you to change suppliers? 
Are the products differentiated? Are there substitutes? Does the supplier depend heavily on your industry? First, video game engine developers do mostly depend on video game developers. And products are somewhat differentiating, but switching costs are pretty low, mainly because most of the game development engines are free now and only require royalties. If you want to switch from, say, Unity to Unreal, well, you just uninstall Unity and download Unreal. It's not a big price, it doesn't take a lot of time even. Substitutes could be making your own engine, however, this there's a that's an entirely another market that we could analyze right there, making your own engines. And many of the service providers have low switching costs. Asset stores are relatively cheap, and you can always find motivated people to join your team and make a game. And with the rise of places like Fiverr and even Reddit and YouTube communities of various kinds of artists and developers, Finding somebody to help is very quick, very easy, and very cheap. Alright, let's look at another box. This one is the Threat of Substitutes box. So, mainly, what could people be doing instead of playing your game? And we narrow it down to a few as you can see here on the screen. The biggest impacting ones are Twitch streams, hanging out with friends, not even playing a game or playing a game that supports a more cooperative environment tabletop games, or really any other interactive content. As you could probably imagine, this list just continues on and on and on. And it's important to know, there's only so many hours in a week, exactly 168 hours in every week, except for maybe daylight savings times. So you need to really convince the customer that they are better off spending time in your game. Now this one is very difficult. This one has a very high influence on game developers. Mainly because it's hard to do that. It's hard to convince people that their time is better spent on what you've created for them. The next thing we're gonna talk about is the threat of new entrants. Now this one, <laughs> this is incredibly high. Probably the highest influencer to really any other market I've really looked at. Why is that? because there's no barrier to entry. Game engines are free, so the cost to start up is free. All you need to do is invest time. No money is needed at first. And to get just a very simple game off the ground, it's super simple. It takes maybe a couple hours of learning and then a couple hours of development and you, you're ready to release something super simple and might be the most popular game. What else makes this a huge threat to new developers? Well, another thing to think of is what's the switching cost for the consumer? Especially when it comes to indie games on Game Jolt, how much does it cost for them to stop playing your game and start playing somebody else's? Very little. In fact, most games on Game Jolt are free, so there's almost no cost except for time associated with that. And along with that, there's incredibly easy distribution for new games coming out. There are so many different platforms and plenty of people willing to publicize new indie games for free. They'll just take it and run with it even without being asked. And it's important to recognize this when you're looking for a business model. And also, it's equal access to these distribution channels. You can't call somebody up and say, hey, I want you to exclusively market my game as an indie developer. You can't do that. You can't say, hey, no, you can't, you can't play my game, you can't do this and that. It's stuff like that. Well, you can tell somebody not to play your game, but that won't really help you out. Another factor that we thought of that you can see here is there's little attention on indie devs, especially in the mainstream. There's just not as much focus as there is on other ones, so that's good for you because the attention is less likely to affect you in the long run meaning you don't really need to worry about that, and if you do take advantage of that little attention, if you somehow manage to get a ton of attention, that is a massive advantage you have over your competition. Now we're going to talk about the middle panel, and that is rivalry among existing competitors. The first thing to talk about is that in the indie game market, yes, the market is highly saturated. There are thousands of games every year coming out. In fact, I could go on Game Jolt every single day, and each day I will find a brand new game to play. On top of this, a lot of developers are making very similar games. 
which can make it a pain to stand out from the crowd if you're making a game that a lot of people are just copying pasting different ideas. Now one thing that's also important is there are a ton of different personalities, there's a ton of different business models and strategies that different indie games are using. Especially the no model approach, which seems to be the most popular, most people don't even think about it, which can create an even more volatile market to compete in. Now this isn't as prevalent when you get to much bigger games, a lot of them do follow many similar approaches, but when you're starting out at the very bottom, there's so much variety from game to game, from day to day. And this can create a lot of tension between producers and personalities, if you will. Another thing to note is that the exit costs are pretty low. Once you make a game, there isn't really anything you need to do. If you just want to leave, you can just drop the game and leave. There's nothing you need to do afterwards. You can just leave it on the internet. Nobody's going to yell at you. And the differentiation between products is another thing. There is... it's... this one's a little bit tricky because there's a lot of differentiation between indie games, but there's also a lot of indie games that come out that are exactly the same as the one before it. So this one's kind of in the middle of the road. It's, it's something that really won't affect you that much, but it's something that is important to notice and it's, you could take advantage of it. You really could strive for that strategy and just focus on making a product that is so different, or it just does the same thing just really well. And another very nice or, I guess, relaxing thing to note is that the market is growing exponentially. So if you just get started today, it there's plenty of room for you to grow and everyone else to grow at the same time. Just because somebody else is growing faster than you, they aren't stealing your business. They're not stealing your spotlight. You can still grow. So. This is one that probably won't affect you too much, but it's something you could also definitely take advantage of. Alright, now we get to go to the fun one, the bargaining power of customers. Before we go on, we need to talk about why this is split up into three categories. This is mainly because there's three distinct things or categories of customer. You have your publishers, you have your distribution platforms, and you actually have the gamers. It's also important to note that in this scenario, we rolled in Let's Players into Gamers, so we'll talk about them inside that category. First off, the publishers. Publishers are very fractured, and what that means is that there's a lot of them, and if you don't get the one you want, there's plenty more that'll pick up your game and run with it. Now, this might be a little debatable, and there's only so many really good publishers, so we'll give this one a medium influence. It it's not enough to say that if you don't get the good publisher, you're out. If you get a bad publisher, you might still have the most successful game ever. So that's not a make it or break it kind of deal, but it's something that can definitely help. The next thing to talk about is distribution platforms. This is Steam, this is Game Jolt, this is really any platform that sells or hosts a lot of game downloads. And these are very consolidated. There are very few good ones. Steam, the App Store, Google Play, maybe Game Jolt. Those are the biggest ones. Maybe, I don't even think Game Jolt qualifies as the biggest one. I think it's really just Steam, the App Store, and Google Play. Those are the biggest, cons like the biggest places you can go to get games. Now, the problem here is it's not too hard to get on these. The App Store isn't hard to get on, Google Play isn't hard. And the problem with this as well is they have a lot of bargaining power. They know they're the only good ones. So this allows these platforms to charge crazy high amounts from your revenues in order to sell your game. But we could go that into that another time and talk for hours on what that means. The last topic, last category, is probably the more interesting one here, and that's the gamers. Because there's a lot of gamer communities, so that's why they're kind of fractured. But the communities themselves are highly consolidated in that one opinion tends to rule the entire community. There's a large number of communities, but the opinions run strong in those communities as well as the influencers, like YouTubers or Twitch streamers, that are prevalent in those communities. So that one, it's kind of tricky, 
that's why this category mainly gets a high is because of the influencers and their ability to sway specific groups and that group to kind of force a similar opinion upon itself. But another thing to notice here is that if you sell them a game and they don't like it or they give you feedback and you don't listen, they'll leave. They are highly, highly influential in the development process of your game, and they can really make or break your game more so than any other factor on this list. The consumer rules in video game development. And we could go even further. We could break that up so much, but for the sake of just this example, we're going to keep it real simple here for you. All right, we've covered a lot of information. Let's take a step back and recap what we've talked about here. Looking at this diagram, I've put it all together and simplified it down to the bare conclusions that we drew from each category. Starting with our bargaining power of suppliers, we decided that that's a really low influence on us because most of the game development engines are already free and a lot of assets you can really just pick and choose who you want to go for. You're not stuck with any one and the switching cost is very low for you to switch to a new supplier. Looking at the threat of new entrants, this is very highly likely to influence you, mainly because there's no barrier to entry. Anybody can pick up and start developing, and anybody can pick up and start promoting their game pretty easily. Your threat of substitutes, because of this threat of new entrants, is very high, because you can make a game and anybody else can come along for a lower budget or even no budget at all and make a similar game that competes with you and there's already plenty of products on the marketplace that can compete with you for your customer's time. Rivalry among the existing competitors is kind of a medium influence simply because there's a lot of people making games, but a lot of people are making a ton of different games, they have a lot of different strategies, they have a lot of different goals with what they're doing, so they're not directly competing with you as much as they're just there trying to make their own way their own way. Another way you could look at this is also because of the marketplace. Right now it's pretty saturated for a lot of different types of games, but the gaming industry is growing, so there's room for all of you to grow in your own little niches. That's why we said it's a medium influence. It could influence you a little bit, but it's not likely to wreck your entire model here. And then we have bargaining power of consumers. Now this one is very high, and if we split it into three different categories, we split it in to the platforms, we split it into your actual gamers, and we split it into your publishers. Now we said this one's very high because gamers ultimately rule. Publishers, not so much, but they're important to you, and your deployment platforms are also important, but there's enough of them that they don't have to influence you too poorly. So putting this all together, how do you put together a strategy? Well, what is a strategy? Well, your strategy, again, remember, it's an integrated set of choices that positions a firm or yourself in a place to succeed, and it's your goal to that success. So now that we do have this better picture, we can kind of start to think, how do we want to position ourselves? What do we want to focus on? So let's pick a goal. Let's say our goal is to be financially stable and able to make video games for a living. Since the barriers are entry to low, you can get started pretty easily, and you can make a game that's pretty well within a week. But now if you want to take advantage of these low barriers, how can you artificially increase the difficulty to entry? Well, it's simple. Spend more time, invest in yourself in making better games, and make a high quality game. Making a simple game is easy, making a very high quality game is a lot harder and requires a lot more patience from a developer, but ultimately it can cost the same as making a really simple game. Or you could make a VR game. That could be your target. VR is actually expensive to get into. It's not hard to make it, but you do need a VR headset in order to test your game. All right, now let's take a different approach. Let's say you don't want to make the highest quality game. Well, you could try the shotgun approach. Just make as many medium or small size games as you can until they start sticking and people start following you, not for one game that you've made, but for the repeated decent quality games or repeated quirky games that you've made. All right, all right, so we've looked at the threat of new entrants a little bit. So now let's talk about the threat of substitutes. How can you take advantage of this high risk or how can you mitigate, excuse me, this risk? 
Well, what you can do for one is make a game that's completely unique in every way. Make it so that it's impossible to replicate, or if somebody does replicate it, everybody will know that they just ripped it off from you. What's another thing you can do? Well, you could copy somebody's game, I guess. That would work, but odds are somebody's going to call you out and that's not going to work too well. So my advice in this category is make a game that you want to make. Make your game, because nobody else can see the game like you see it. And make sure you emphasize that. Make sure you make your perspective on this game integral to it. Because all people can do is try and hit it, but they're never going to see it exactly like you see it. And that's the important part of this category. Unfortunately for the bargaining power of suppliers, it's, it's so easy for somebody else to just grab from your supplier and there's nothing you can really do here. But the advantage is that supplier doesn't really care what that person does or they're not they're not benefiting by favoring another developer that's developing an indie game. So you could re realistically ignore this category and be completely fine. Just be aware and understand how it can affect the threat of new entrants. The same kind of goes for rivalry among existing competitors. There's not a whole lot you can do, although marketing is a good strategy to try and get ahead of them. You could also use their games as a platform to boost your game. I don't suggest this though, as a lot of people see it as kind of a jerk move, so I'd avoid that. And then the bargaining power of consumers. One way you could take advantage of this is get all buddy-buddy with a publisher and see what they want. See if they will give you some kickbacks if you create maybe a game that they're more likely to promote or a game that will fit into their playstyle a little bit better or their audience. Another thing you can do is with gamers, build a focus group, get a community engaged in what you're making, share your stuff, get people to give you feedback and listen to their feedback. It seems pretty simple, but there's a lot of bigger games out there that really just don't listen to the feedback they're given. Show consumers that you care about their input by putting it into your game. Now don't let them take your game over, but listen to what they say and say, hey, I didn't like that exactly, but I took that and got this other idea and implemented it for you. Tell me what you think. It's amazing how much street credit you can get for doing that. Sorry for the euphemism, I'm not even sure that's the right word, but it's, it's crazy. I see it so many times where somebody gives good feedback and the developer just ignores and now you've lost a consumer, you've lost a fan. But if you listen, even if you just pretend to listen, that person is going to think that you cared and they're going to feel valued. Now if you'll notice about all these strategies I was talking about, it's not just one or the other. All of these strategies can work together and I tried to stay a little bit vague because I don't want to influence you and tell you this is the best strategy because it's not. It depends on what you're trying to do. I'm hoping this tool will simply give you a way to analyze the market around you and you can use it to your advantage to market your game better or even build a better game. So if you guys do have questions, please let me know in the comments below and I will try and answer them as best I can. The last thing I really want to touch on is something I mentioned in one of my first videos for the dev spot and that is be sure to focus on your support system. Be sure to do something for your small community at first or even that one person that showed a little bit of interest. Try and get them engaged and start slowly building on that and taking input from other players as they come along. And just remember, these strategies are not a implement it and you win the game. No, it's, it's going to take time, it's going to take a lot of effort, it's going to take your passion for the industry. But this will set you up better to succeed, and as you grow, it'll be easier to manage your success, and easier to keep insight what's important to you. Alright guys, so I hope this was helpful to you, and I hope you were able to generate some ideas and able to think about things in maybe a little bit different way. I do again want to give a shout out to my friends at Rock Knight Studios for helping me out with this, specifically Matisse for coming up with a full script to read through and modify and stuff. He was a huge help in making this. You guys should definitely go check out their game on Game Jolt and check out their Twitch because they're making a new game right now. And I know at least Matisse has stressed his interest in wanting to talk to people about this stuff. I know he's been super excited in talking to me and getting organized with myself, motivating me to actually 
get out of bed and start working on some stuff. But please head over to their stream, check them out. They love talking about the industry, game dev, and small indie games. And something I know he would suggest, and I would also recommend this highly, is and don't do this on yourself right away. Do this on a bigger industry. Practice on some more obvious examples, or even look at companies like EA or CD Projekt Red. I know these aren't indie ga uh, game developers, but they use similar tools like this to develop their business strategies, and they at one point were very small, just like you are right now. So guys, again, thank you for watching, and remember to hit that subscribe button and like button. But in the meantime, until next video, guys, please take care of yourself, and I'll see you later.